Hey everyone, my name is Daniel Schwager. I want to thank you all for coming uh, to another edition of Anatomy of a Score with our very special, awesome cosmic guest, Mr. Tyler Bates. All right. All right. We should just take names because we are yeah. friends now. <laughs> Yeah, many of us are. I heard you had a little indie movie open up this weekend. You know, it's playing at the Lemley. You know, I'm just I'm just a soldier in the battle. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right. So, how many people have seen Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two? All right. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to avoid spo spoilers. Uh. <laughs> We're gonna tell you the entire plot. The entire plot. <laughs> <laughs> It seems like it would be out there already. There's been like five million images and things said. I, I don't talk about this stuff because I work under an NDA all the time. So I don't like doing any interviews because people ask me about stuff and they might trick me into saying something or this other movie I did that's coming out four months later. It's like, oh, man, you know, so I'd rather just not talk about any of it. You know? Okay, I think the NDA has been cleared at this point. I mean, a couple, yeah. couple people have seen it, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looks that way. You know, so whenever I do these things, I always like to kind of get clips together that uh, show, shows the road we're on to, to where we get. And, um, you know, Tyler, you, you really caught my attention when you started out doing some really cool, unique, kind of, again, indie scores for stuff like Rated X, one of my favorite jazz beat movies the last time I committed suicide. And you did such a really cool, unusual score for the, the Stallone version of Get Carter. Um, but for me, it's kind of like I think you kind of went next level when you scored uh, 300, uh, you know, which is based on a comic book, it's a graphic novel of uh, Frank Miller. And it really just showed this whole kind of epic nature to your sound. Uh, I mean, what, was there any kind of challenge at all in getting to, to the point of you know, this massive orchestral score for 300? It's always a challenge <clears throat> to not get fired. No. <laughs> Actually, you know what, I never even heard of 300 when Zach asked me to do it. It was after Dawn of the Dead, and uh, so he asked if I heard of the book, and I'm like, no. So I went over to his house, and he and the writer, or co-writer, Kurt Johnstead, showed me the book, and they were talking about it. And so we spent about a year or more developing a pitch. So there was no deal for it. So I was doing music for statues and drawings and whatnot, and then we did an animatic for that movie. Um, and I was doing a record at the time with Azam Ali, and it was kind of like a hybrid rock, uh, sort of, I'd say, Middle Eastern culture influence to that music. So the timing was pretty good, because I had done a considerable amount of studying, you know, about the various influences that I thought just, I guess, serendipitously ended up being an excellent influence for what that music sounded like. But, I mean, everything's a challenge, no matter what. And um, you know, I just wanted to do something that was cool. And I would rather try uh, to create something that hasn't been done exactly like, like you're hearing and fail, you know, at trying to create something unique or even commercial than just trying to emulate, you know, what's already done. So that's what my career is pretty crazy. If you look at the, all the movies, you know, um, and every couple of years I get pigeonholed into a new genre. You know, at one point I was the urban guy. And then I did uh, some comedies, uh, which is funny, but now people would think, no, he doesn't do comedy. And then I did uh, some horror films and did a lot of work with Rob Zombie and Zack Snyder and James Gunn. So then that's what I did. And then, uh, you know, it started opening up into other things. And it was funny because when we were recording the score, uh, Matt Walker of Disney happened to be in London and he's head of all their theme park music. And he's like a big guy. So anyway, he came to my session and we were recording a, a Q. I think it was the Q Dad. It was one of those very emotional, sweeping cues. And he just came over and said, I had no idea. And I'm like, what? He says, well, it's so emotional and so melodic. And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, if you pay me to hurl bricks at the screen, I will do that. <laughs> said, but, but, you know, this is natural to me. So, and it is. Now, 300 leads you into essentially your first real superhero score. 
which is The Watchmen. Uh, I think personally one of my favorite superhero film adaptations ever, especially the long version of it, which incorporates the comic book. Um, and again, it's a, such an amazingly diverse uh, range of styles. You've got like hardcore heavy metal, you've got this Pink Floyd psychedelia. And uh, in this little clip we have uh, just really robust, incredibly thematic uh, superhero music. Well, that, that's really got it all. <laughs> you know, got the... oh. well, that was uh, that was fun. That's kind of like a a scene like that. You know, we want to give Silk Spectre like a, a real beautiful but powerful entrance, um, one that definitely underscores her equality in the entire bunch. Um, so I wanted it to be really kind of heavy, but also emotionally complex. And yet we're really, for the most part, pedaling in one chord. It's almost like sculpting in a way. The, I, I think of it more as color and emotion. You know, I don't really sit down at the piano to do that. I form it in my head and then I transcribe something like that. But the motive behind that was to give her that kind of a feeling and make it fun, obviously, at the end, because they do go out on a fun mission. They're thrill seekers. Um, yeah, that was cool. It just took me way back. Uh, it was like 2009 or something. Eight, eight or yeah. nine, I think. I think we recorded 2008. What does superhero music mean to you? Mm. See, that's not really... A, a, I can't give you a great answer for that because I'm not into it. Um, I think there are stereotypes that, that have been done so well that I'm bored with the idea of creating something that's traditionally within the paradigm of what we know. I mean, it, you know, it's Superman and all that stuff that was done since we were unborn, you know. Um, <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's, it's so good like that I, I can't think of myself as writing on something the scale of that. So I just completely approach it from my own sense of storytelling and emotion related to the director's sensibilities. And uh, you mentioned Watchmen. I didn't read the graphic novel. I have it. I read it after the movie because I felt that the preconceived notions of perhaps uh, what perhaps what I thought the audience would expect from me would, would probably be polarizing. So uh, I chose not to do that. Now, obviously, when you see a scene like we just saw, you know, I, uh, she needs something fantastical to really support her entrance, and it's not the same as if she were wearing a business suit. So um, that's a different movie. So anyway, you know, I mean, I just get, I put myself in the moment, and I think about what would I want to feel if I'm in the audience and I'm experiencing this. You know, it's not about my personal like chops or something. You know, I mean, I don't think like that. You know. Now, uh, Dawn of the Dead, your first uh, movie score for Zack Snyder was written by James Gunn. And, uh, and then it kind of began the collaboration, which has now led to Gardens of the Galaxy Volume 2. Um, so I want to talk about your collaboration actually by starting with two particularly gooey clips uh, from Super and Slither, uh, directed by James Gunn. I've not seen those movies in, since they're done. Um, that's funny. So the first one, Super, was the second movie I did with James. Um, film scoring has changed so much since that era. It's, uh, it's not even the same business or process as it once was. Um, it's very interesting. So the first movie, Super, uh, that was duct taped together, essentially. There was like, no money to do anything. So we just you know put together what, what we could for it, but it was fun. I mean that's the sensibility of the movie where it's really DIY and um, it's rough around the edges. So it worked for that. Now think about that. That's James's movie just prior to Guardians of the Galaxy. That movie made three hundred and twenty-two thousand dollars at the box office total <laughs> worldwide. <laughs> 
and you know Guardians will make 150 million just this weekend here. So that's crazy. Uh, but what's really, what's really interesting about Super is essentially you're playing uh, again a, a super powered character, but in his own mind, which is psychotic. But isn't that what all of us do in our lives? <laughs> it's in our own mind. Whatever we think, whatever we, you know, we think we're seeing all the same colors on the wall, but we're really not. So um, I don't know. It's fun to play with that idea. Um, the first or the second clip was from from Slither, which was the first movie I did with James. That was cool. Uh, it was a much more traditional score, but really the 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 mix of that is, is entirely why I do music independent of movies and go out and play music. Because I can at least do exactly what I want and have it heard exactly how I want it to be. But that was fun, you know. James and I have had a pretty, uh, a pretty energetic collaboration since the beginning and it's been really cool. Um, nowadays, I would say since around 2012, Everything has changed with the larger movies, with the amount of money they're spending to produce them, with the the visual effects process. The schedules are so uh, frenetic, even if they're long. It's it's a it's like running several marathons to get through one of them. So uh, it's interesting looking back. It was such a different time and a different way that we worked together. You know, a lot of a lot of collaborating just in my studio and. And now it's definitely different. And I think, you know, for me, one thing that really distinguishes James' movies, you know, he, he's like definitely the biggest success story to ever come out of the trauma. May I call him actually work there very briefly. Um, but, in, and again, he's kind of like in your face. There's a kind of really warped hipness to his movies that are a lot of fun. And again, you could say the same thing about a lot of your crazier scores. I mean, do you think you guys are just these two outsiders who have gelled like you have because of that? Hmm. Yeah, probably so. I've been through a lot in my life uh, since the beginning. <laughs> it's been intense. So I I have a feeling that I don't have, and I do, but I mean, I, it, artistically, I always kind of just go for broke and kind of go what's going on and for what's in here. Um, and as a, you know, it's obviously formed by the conversations I have with my collaborators and understanding their sensibility. Uh, but I, I'm not like thinking, wow, how can we be wacky or zany? I'm just into the characters. And if you've seen all of James's movies, you'll you'll recognize the dialogue. And, and all of his films are very stylistically him. Uh, and you notice the voice in Super, Marry Her, that's Rob Zombie. So on Slither, James asked me if I could hook him up with somebody who would be like cool in pop culture to just do some voice work. So he's in every one of... James's movies now, his voice. Uh, so, oh, you know, interesting how worlds collide. Um, so but, when, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a different time. It was just James and I. There was there was no focus grouping and no battery of of producers and everything. And now it's very very intense, and it's cool. The end result is is great, but it's it's thoroughly uh, challenging. Now, when, when James says to you, hey, guess what we're going to do? Mar we're going to do Guardians of the Galaxy for Marvel, another, you know, kind of taking a kind of like B-level characters and, you know, doing this unexpected massive hit with them. But what, what's your initial reaction like when he says, hey, guess what? You're, we're going to do Guardians of the Galaxy. Well, there's two things. First off, I didn't know what it was. I was in London. He called me up. We were recording a score for a God of War Ascension video game. And uh, he says, dude, I I think I have this gig, Guardians of the Galaxy, and he says, I need to know, are you in? And I'm like, well, well yeah, I did PG porn, I'll do whatever this is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I gathered, you know, you know, I looked it up, I'm like, oh, this is a big deal. Um, so that was great, and I was really happy for him. I never doubted him at all. So I had an agent at the time who I'm still friends with, and I'm back with people that I had begun my career with, and I'm very happy. But when I first went to these people to represent me, I said, and I was going over my clients or my directors or whatever you want to call it. I'm like, yeah, James Gunn. I told them about Super, how awesome it is, and they just rolled their eyes. They rolled their eyes because it says $322,000 at the box office. And I said, 
I assure you this guy's going to make a movie that's going to make a mark in Hollywood, like a big one. And uh, I'm like, yeah, okay. So um, sure enough, that's his next movie. So I never doubted it because I know him well and I know how talented he is and how driven he is to, to expand on his, his talent. Hence the term expansion that is uh, elaborated on in the movie. Um, but uh, there's a lot of him in that movie for sure. <laughs> but uh, the one thing that I really do enjoy about working with James is you come out of the experience stronger and better for it. And, you know, there are times where you want to kill yourself or kill him or something because he, he pushes really hard. But at the end of the day, you end up... Uh, stronger and, and better collaborator for it so uh, you have to put yourself in that situation if you want to if you want to grow as an artist now, you know one thing that I think you know the charm of the Guardians is that you know well the Avengers you know you've got a playboy you know patriotic hero you know characters who are for the most part pretty self-assured about who they are and who their mission is uh, the Guardians are essentially these misfits who are thrown together who become inadvertent heroes and have to learn how to you know, get along. I mean, what was your reaction you know, once you found out uh, who these characters were? Uh, oh, when I saw the first image that was released, you know, when it was announced James was doing the movie, I'm like, wow, that is awesome. This is a picture of the five from the first film. Um, that, was, that was really cool. The thing that I really liked about it was they were not they were not all pristine and, you know, incredible superheroes with superpowers. They were all completely, you know, fucked up. So, <laughs> so I can relate to that. Broken people, um, you know, tend to interest me more as far as my inspiration to write, you know, uh, not looking to paint monuments. I would rather, you know, kind of work in a more dystopian you know, uh, environment and these characters and the dynamics between them. I knew uh, once once I familiarized myself with the property that it would it would challenge me to write in every pretty much every style or emotion in the film. And of course, James wants us to relate emotionally to these characters completely uh, in reality, not writing raccoon music or tree music. You know, so you know we want to root all of our emotions and in a reality and that was something that I really was excited about because it was the first chance I think I got to really blow up an emotional score. Now what's you, again one thing that's great about your score for both of these films is that you've just got such a wonderful superhero theme you know just like what, what makes a great superhero theme for you? I, you're the one who should tell me that because <laughs> you know way more about this stuff than I do. Uh, you know, you know every. Well, I think a sense of nobility. You know every soundtrack and, that's ever been made, oh, man. Christ. People here who know more than I do, but but I mean, no, no, for me, it's a sense I, of nobility. Here, look, the, the thing is, is, the music. The music has to be careful not to to slip away from its association or attachment to the heart of the characters, and that's their inner dialogue. There's something, there's a humility inside them regardless of what their behavior is on the exterior that is important to imbue the music with. And I think sometimes, you know, it's very easy to get caught up only with the visual side of it and the fanfare of how the characters are presented to, to lose touch with that intimacy. And I think that that's something that I value a lot when I write music uh, for anything, you know, I mean, it's, it's really about understanding the sensibilities of the characters, it's about understanding the sensibilities of directors and producers, you know, um, I'm not one to, to judge people, clearly, if you're aware of everything that I do, um, I want to understand people so that I can become a, you know, more informed artist. But one thing is, is concurrent in all the music that I do is, is that it's all attached to some sort of inner dialogue with the characters that's never spoken. Well, I have uh, two clips from Guardians of the Galaxy that I sh really show off the wonderful theme uh, towards the end of the film. Oh, yeah, there's a story about
There's a reason you can hold that infinity stone. <laughs> okay, so, all right, hey, oh, Groot Cocoon was the first one. That's what that's called. So, and James asked me to write a sequence for him to film to, uh, and that was written from the script, and then shot to it, and the music stayed almost exactly the same, which is remarkable considering the picture changes so much when we're doing one of these movies for a 90-minute score. We deliver about, on the first one, uh, 1,100 minutes of fully mocked up orchestral cues that would probably be fine just sitting in any movie. Um, you wouldn't know. But that's how intense it is. Uh, but anyway, that was cool that he shot to that, and so that stayed intact. And you know, there's so much noise going on in this the picture. I wanted to develop a slower moving theme so that it didn't get completely canceled out by all that the noises. Um, <laughs> again, you know, once in a while you just have to do some standalone music just so you can hear all the details. Like at the very end there, after they grab the stone, there's so much detail in the music that you don't hear that um, you'd feel it if it were not there. But um, but you don't really hear it. So the story about that, there are two, two themes that are playing on that, uh, on that sequence where they all join hands. Uh, the first one was the Guardians of the Galaxy theme, which was later uh, named Black Tears. And so it was also written for the first movie, and we thought that was our main theme. And it's beautiful, you know, and, and it was inspired by Quill's mother passing away. And, um, you know, I... I can relate to that personally, so that's really what that was uh, inspired by for me was was my own experience. But in uh, in the process of writing the score for the sec the the actual movie when we're in post production, James calls me up one day, and I'm already like doing myself and my crew. We're all doing like 18 hour days, seven days a week. So he calls me up. He's like, "Dude, this is a, it was a Saturday. I remember it." <laughs> I don't think we have the actual Guardians theme. And so my re response inside my brain was not, oh, that's great. It was just, you know, one word, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay. He says, look, man, Black Tears is incredible, but we need something more triumphant. I said, okay. And he said, something that a four-year-old can see. So I said, okay, let's see what I can do. And so I, I tapped out two themes just quickly, because if I, you know, just kind of ruminated on it for a while, I'd spend a week. I just, so before I could think about it, I just did two, I sent them to them, they were really crappy mock-ups, you know, they sounded like they were, you know, they were just very basic. And so he called me back and he's like, dude, the second one is it. I'm like, really? You like that one better than the first one? He says, yeah, that's it. So actually, the good thing about that is I still have the first one, <laughs> and it's pretty good. So um, he he liked that, and at that point, I was just happy that he was into it, and then we just started, you know, blowing that up into full orchestral bliss, and uh, it's obviously stated very prominently many times in the second movie. Uh, it's written into the script, so it's not just completely uh, an arbitrary choice for me. I and mean, believe me, all the choices are made by many people. Um, so it's a real challenge to emerge through this process and maintain your artistic voice throughout. Um, but it's, a, it's cool, you know, everybody I deal with it, uh, in these Marvel movies is very, very insightful intelligent and actually very pleasant to work with regardless of how much stress there is on the situation but uh, I was happy that we came up with a theme that James liked and has been developed into David Hasselhoff's new single so uh, <laughs> you know didn't see that coming <laughs> you know and it is funny like the story of my life is literally like you know it's two o'clock on a Thursday night or what, Friday morning, and I'm telling my friend Marilyn Manson, I'm like, you have to get out of here. I gotta get up at seven in the morning, man. <laughs> so we work together and and so uh, then the next morning, you know, Hasselhoff's coming over like at ten. And that's 
every day of my life was like that. So while well, it's it's extremely challenging and exhausting, it's really fun. Like this last few years of my life's been just pretty incredible. You know, I mean, it's, I couldn't even have written a script like this. You know, so it's not. You know, one thing that really hit me about Guardians too is just how emotional the the film. It's actually for me one of the most emotional of the the Marvel movies. Uh, and what, how do you want? How did you want to capture this film's overriding theme of fatherhood and family? Well, I think it's. You know, I mean, James has a great relationship with his folks, so I'm guessing that this is not. Uh, this is not directly derived from his personal experience, although he's a very sensitive and aware person when it comes to the myriad dynamics of life. Um, and I'm good with my dad, but you know, there are definitely there's definitely an absence in my life that I wish that I had experienced. You know, uh, I wish I had David Hasselhoff as my <laughs> my dad. Um, but uh, I, th I think again, it, it it comes it comes with knowing what absence or loss is in your life, and yearning for that to be answered or, or quelled in some way. So, um, for me, I, I'm very comfortable and familiar with that, and it was nice to be able to state it in a very epic way as well as a more intimate way in Guardians too. So. Um, that was cool, you know. I welcome that. And don't get me wrong, I like Belco experiment was absolutely disturbing, but you know, I enjoyed doing that as well. It was a completely different animal. You know? Now, I really love the character of Mantis uh, in Guardians too. Uh, the, it's an empathic character trying to find her own way. How did you want to hit her? Um, she's cool, and you know, of course, I didn't know what character that was until I read the script and. I didn't know if James created Mantis or what, you know. I'd, I know it sounds almost aloof, but it's just better for me not to know so that I have a true first impression of these these characters and they don't just fall into the line of everything that we come to, we've come to expect. I'm not surprised by the emotional depth of the movie. I mean, James is very, very comfortable uh, with every emotional dynamic and he's very comfortable experiencing two simultaneously even if they're very disparate so that makes the writing of music for his films uh, a, a challenging and complex endeavor because there is well there's beauty as part of a statement there's also sometimes violence there's you know sadness uh, juxtaposed with a very hopeful feeling and, you know, you find several situations in the film that are clearly, you know, uh, they imbued with that duality. Now, I mean, now who would have ever thought that one of Kurt Russell's best performances would be his ego, the living planet? Uh, and he, he's just wonderful in the film. And there's, again, some such emotional resonance to, to this character. How, tell me about handling ego in relation to Kurt Russell. Again, you know, it's, it's it's hard to think too much about it because, you know, I'm writing for this character or I can go, holy shit, it's Kurt Russell, man. <laughs> I mean, you, you kind of have to, you just have to divorce yourself from thinking that way. At this point, you know, I've been around a lot of large personalities in my life, so I look at it as, as work, although I was thrilled. Just like doing the way with Martin Sheen in that movie was... It was such a, an important experience for me personally, especially because that movie means so much to their entire family. Uh, to be part of that was really cool, you know. Um, but again, this with Kurt Russell, like I don't think if I were you, if you met him, said, "Dude, I think this might be your best or one of your best performances ever," because no one really wants to hear that. It's like, wait, what about this or this or this? So. You know, I'm cool with it because I know that I haven't written my best music yet and challenged to write the best thing, you know, today or tomorrow because no one gives a damn what you did 10 years ago when you're in the business. So I'm cool with it, but, you know, I don't know about actors. Now, you know, they, they have, you know, movies still have what they call Irving the Explainer. And in Guardians 2, you've got Ego the Explainer, which is one of my favorite sequences in the film, which is this really kind of great, trippy, 
Pink Floyd's guitar vibe, uh, and you you actually did that live. Uh, to that was the that was the beginning of that idea. Um, sometimes I get completely stupid and decide to put myself in a situation that could be good, like the outcome could be good or it could be disastrous. So I do this um, oftentimes to create a conversation about music that makes the music itself, the idea of the music, very tangible to everyone around me, even if they don't understand how to talk about music. If they're there when a music moment happens, they now feel part of the process. And I think that you know, genuinely that's what I aim to do. If, if people are part of a collaboration, we want everybody to feel emotionally invested in it and, then, and obviously included, respected, everything you want to, adjective you want to say that would go along with that. But I felt that with Guardians, because James is usually so busy, he doesn't come to my studio, which used to be entirely on his way to work. Um, but every 10 minutes of his day is scheduled on a movie like Guardians because of visual effects and ADR and everything else that's going on with it. So my music is presented to both him and all the executives in my music editor's room, which is you know probably a quarter this size, and it's a dark room. And he he arbitrarily determines where um, the music will sit in the mix, and it's with sound effects and dialogue. And after a while, it's like the music just appears in the computer. You know, there's not this this discussing an idea and then me being able to do something like there on the spot. Like in Super, James and I were talking and I just picked up a guitar and started developing a piece of music while I was there and he's like, yes, that's totally it, you know. So there's a lot of power that, that uh, a collaboration that derives from that experience. And so, you know, while we know each other very well, sometimes it's easy to think, yeah, well, we know each other so well, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I really felt like we needed to reconnect musically as a group. So there was a sequence that they had been working on in, in Real Five, and it had been kind of editorially um, developing a little more slowly than the rest of the movie. So they said, just hold off on this for a while. And it was when it was time to address it, uh, I decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to have a music moment here. Okay, we're going to do something different. So I brought. Uh, uh, my guitar viol and some amps and pedals and all kinds of stuff into the music editorial's uh, uh, office and I asked that uh, we schedule an extra 10 or 15 minutes with James for this particular meeting. So um, we were done with the meeting and I said, oh, hang on a second, I have something for you, you know, because we were playing back music that he was anticipating hearing, but he, we weren't really focusing on this segment and it was four and a half minutes. So I said, look, um, I want to play live to the picture just so that we can really, you know, you know, get an idea for what we want to do, how we want to approach this segment. So it was really interesting because I, I did a dry run. Like I, I knew the movie, but I hadn't worked out the music. I was just going to go. So uh, I started playing and then I used the loop station to take phrases and repeat them, which obviously if you don't hit that just right, then that's really bad. Um, so anyway, uh, it was going pretty good, and and it was it was neat because James just he blew up. He's just like, that's not fair. He says, it's not fair. I love this, and I'm like, well, good. Then let's do this, and I'm still playing the picture, and uh, that's how that worked out. We recorded that meeting, and I took that four and a half minutes and transcribed it, and that's really what's in the movie. But it's it's expanded the orchestra and proper recordings. But yeah, that was cool. And it was a, it was a powerful m moment because it really re-centered our, our collaborative energy and put the focus back into that. And we were, you know, not long after that going into orchestration mode. So it's a very sort of technical mode that doesn't involve the director a great deal. Now, after Guardians, uh, you're moving on to a, uh, another Marvel character who's going to be in Netflix. He's called The Punisher. Uh, what can you, any sneak peeks you can give us about your approach to that show? I know that I have to write 10 minutes of Punisher music <laughs> today. Oh, boy. <laughs> Holy hell. <laughs> that is really cool. I, you know, again, I didn't know anything about The Punisher, which is, I guess, blasphemous because anytime someone 
hears about the Punisher. Like if I say, oh, yeah, I'm working on this thing, Punisher, they're like, what? I'm like, and it always comes with the hand gesture, what? So I'm like, I'm like awesome. Uh, first off, the people I'm working with are fantastic. Uh, Steve Lightfoot, the writer and showrunner, is is great a person as you could ever work with. So I'm thrilled about the opportunity to do it. And I think we're taking a surprising approach musically to addressing this character as opposed to how uh, the Punisher appears in Daredevil. Um, it's really great. I can't talk about anything. You have to literally kill that. me. <laughs> well, you know, it's like, yeah, I can't, you know, like I'm super excited for Atomic Blonde, but I can't really tell you anything. But I can tell you that you've seen the trailer and... I promise you, some movies you see the trailer and you're like, hey, I saw the trailer. No, that movie is awesome. <laughs> it's, it's so, so good. So from first beat to the last, it's really great. Does anyone have any questions for Tyler? Thanks. Uh, Gendy is a close friend for a number of years. And we did a show years ago called Symbionic Titan, and there were only 20 episodes, unfortunately, but I really loved that show. And uh, he's a genius in a way that um, is so not Hollywood. And Gendy has a very blue-collar attitude, but he's a very, very smart guy and awesome once you get to know him. Um, so with Samurai Jack, the interesting thing is we didn't realize until there, we, there was a premiere party after we'd done a few episodes. And so he asked if, you know, I'd put together some kind of a performance for it. And so we did a 10-minute thing at the Ace Theater prior to the, the first three episodes being screened um, back to back. And he was completely blown away at the time because he had last done Samurai Jack 13 years ago. So all of a sudden, he becomes aware that there's a massive following for it now. And it was kind of a little boutique thing back in the day. So he was really excited about it. And I'm kind of glad I didn't know that it was super popular or anything. Because, again, there's a certain pressure or like a preconceived idea of what it already is. Because I think they did like four seasons. But this one's different because it's on Adult Swim. So, you know, he's able to hit a little harder and be a little bit edgier with some of uh, the, t the graphics and the topics and the language and whatnot. Um, he didn't ask for any reference to any previous music for Samurai Jack. And obviously, when we were getting into this, you know, when he asked me to do it, I had the Punisher going on and Guardians. So he said, look, I know, I know you can't like, do the show, but I want you to be involved and oversee everything if you're you know a couple of your collaborators will work on it and I said well Joe she works with me every day she's a she's a young composer who's really growing rapidly with her uh, her talent and Dieter Hartman who works with me who worked on Guardians and many movies with me he's a great great composer um, there's something to be said for that alone that you know I don't think a lot of the people who contribute to making scores what they are in the end are really acknowledged and recognized for their talent and not everybody is truly capable of actually being in the driver's seat and navigating that or ever getting to the point where you get hired or being able to you know we work on packages so sometimes I'm carrying a lot of money out of my own bank account to get things done until I get paid someday you know and um so Dieter has been with me uh, a long time, and uh, Tim Williams, who also has worked with me forever, he was, he was a little busy. He said, no, I'm going to do this other thing, and plus he was working with me on Guardians too. And um, so Joe, you know, she wanted to give it a shot. So Gendy was very comfortable with Dieter and Joanne uh, as long as I was involved. So he comes in for a spotting session, and that's where we'll watch the show and discuss music and where it's going to be placed and, you know, the dynamics and emotions. And Gendy is the ultimate when it comes to storytelling and emotion. And 
when we first when I first met him on uh, Symbiotic Titan, I went to his office at Cartoon Network. He's busy doing Hotel Transylvania three right now, so he's just at his house, which is near my house, or he comes to my studio, or he's at Sony. Anyway, so he'll come. You know, I learned that he he worked this particular way years ago, but. It took me by surprise again when we started working on Samurai Jack. We're ready to spot the first episode. And I told Joanne, I'm like, record this. So we're small talking, you know, because, you know, we hang out and do stuff when we have time. And so after 15, 20 minutes of, you know, how's the kids, all that stuff, I'm like, you ready? It's like, okay, I'm ready. Like, here we go. Boom, hit the space bar, the show starts playing, and then he's like, he beatboxes the entire sound design. He says, in music, I'm thinking right here. So he'll do it like he's a six year old in his backyard, you know? But it's, it's not pretentious at all. It is really, really insightful and helpful. And it's a clear expression of how he's feeling about the storytelling and the, sh the show itself. And he's very clear that this is sound design and then this is music. And they very rarely, other than the practical sounds you need to hear, like dialogue and maybe the dropping of an object or something, I mean, they very rarely overlap. So it's great that the power of the music of that show has been able to speak to people. And I'm really happy that Joanne and Dieter get a composing credit for doing the show because they both deserve it very much. And, you know, I, I help distill what Gendy's looking for in these meetings and I assist to make sure the process is going well. But Dieter and Joe have it and they've done a great job and we just finished the final episode today. So um, it's really exciting. It just feels good to be involved with something where you know that that the people behind it are very artful and they challenge themselves and they're humble and they're really excited about it. So it's a privilege to be part of, of it in, on any level. Thanks. Any other questions for Tom? Yeah, besides music, do you like, I love collecting things, do you collect anything, guitars, anything like music wise, or do you keep costume films or anything? Um, or not really? Well, guitars, obviously. <laughs> Yeah. What's the most awesome guitar you have? This is funny. So, you know, obviously if you know much about me, I've been working with Marilyn Manson, so I go out on tour with him to support the music we work on together, and I'll play some of the other stuff too. We're just finishing a new record this weekend, and it's really powerful. So I love the fact that I've gotten back to my first love in life, which is guitar. Um, even though my musical uh, training began before then. Um, so I do collect some guitars. Uh, my favorite guitar is a Gibson ES347. And when I play on tour, and for most things, I play Schechter guitars, which my friend is the president of that company and designs all their guitars. But my ES347 was his guitar that I got from him many, many years ago. And so he designed a, a model that I play with Manson after that guitar. And um, I love it. And, you know, it's not the end of the world if I break the ones he gives me. Because, you know, trust me. I mean, I, and nothing is lost to me. I'm so fortunate to have opportunities to work and that actually somebody is asking me to a dance. Um, but sometimes the stress of it all and the pent-up anxiety from getting so many notes and adjusting to picture changes and trying to do a great job and everybody in your business knowing you're doing a gig like Guardians of the Galaxy. If I fail at that, everybody knows it. So the pressure is so high. So to go out on tour, sometimes at the end of a show just to take a guitar and throw it across the stage, <laughs> fucking awesome. <laughs> I'm kind of curious about, like, you know, your process with, you know, the higher ups and the backseat driving and the bad notes. About, you know, in, in regards to how how big to go, because theater's different on the big screen than like later viewings on on TV, like Blu-ray or or whatever. Um, 
as opposed to when you're just doing your own thing and you're in your zone, you know? Well, there are different types of collaboration, right? Obviously, this is a monster. I guess this movie's going to make a billion dollars. For, not for me, but for someone. <laughs> um, so we, you, know, you know the nature of the beast. And while you never really enjoy notes that are diametrically opposed to what your original idea is or your instincts, and believe me, we go through every possibility for every sequence and usually end up back at the first idea. Um, it's exhausting. But, you know, it's sometimes people have a great note, and I agree with it sometimes, you know, of course. So we want to examine every note, and if the score gets better for it, if the movie becomes stronger for it, then it's good. You know, I don't have, like, an ego problem about my music. This is commissioned, and my heart and soul is in it, but it's owned by Marvel. And then when I work on records, like in, with Manson, it's the two of us. So whatever we like is what happens. And so that's a, it's up to me to do stuff like that so that I can be effective in a collaboration of a larger sort. So I'm not trying to hold on to this, this you know, myopic vision of myself or my own music in the context of a massive blockbuster movie. With Manson, it's just him and I, he and I having a conversation and I literally write the music on the spot with him there and that's how we do it. It's just us. There's no notes. There's no nothing. So that too is great. Um, I would say that this type of work on these larger films has helped me in every facet of my my creative life because it makes you stronger. It makes you get to the focus of your ideas quicker to be able to write songs on the spot to know no matter what, three hours from now, we're going to have a song. And we're going to have a good one. Like Manson and I have never thrown away a song. Everything's been on a record or in a movie. So I just, you, you don't, like you can't miss the point when you present music to everybody on a movie like this. If you miss the point twice, then there's might be someone else who, who can get the point, if you get what I mean. So, now that said, the Marvel executives are great. They know what they're making. I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy is like this big deal, but it's also a pixel in a massive Marvel universe. And Kevin Feige knows where this is going, as does Lou and, and Victoria. So, their perspective is valuable to me. So that I don't you know, that I satisfy what it is that they, that common denominator that is going to work in the Marvel universe, and they still allow me to be myself. So their, their requirements are, are pretty general. They just, you know, sometimes Kevin will say, hey, you know, I would really love to feel the Guardians theme here. I think this is the moment. And oftentimes, you know, it's already been done and we just bring up another version of what we're listening to, you know, another cue and it's there. So uh, just try and get out in front of everything. But if somebody has a great idea, it doesn't make me a less, lesser composer. It doesn't bruise my ego or anything like that. It's like, it's not that I don't care. I do care. And that's why I'm open to hearing, you know, I want to learn more about what I'm doing and learn more about the craft and learn more about people's sensibilities and storytelling and you know hopefully I'll do something that's really really good at some point you know so that's, that's it I mean he he gives me all sorts of notes <laughs> <laughs> in my dreams and he uh... you said you weren't really connected with the character before you made it was there a particular character or theme in Guardians that you instantly connected to musically well, the first one, I just can't help it because, you know, this kid's losing his mom, you know. I wasn't as quite as young as him when my mother died, but she died in an accident. So it was the sense of loss and tragedy is, it rang very familiar with me, especially because my mother was such a music enthusiast and is probably why I have a career in music because she didn't see me as a freak. Like my father saw me as a freak when I was a kid. So, um, and I probably am, but... Uh, she just, you know, we just had this, this culture of music in our lives. And, you know, she bought like 10 records a week. So music was happening all the time. And sometimes I'd get into something like Kiss, you know, I'd be like, Ace Freely's awesome. 
And she'd be like, yeah, come here, let me show you something, you know? And she'd play me some, something relatable, like Jeff Beck or something. I'd be like, I, all right, I understand. <laughs> so she kept, kept my head in the musical side of music and never made me feel that it was a, a senseless endeavor to see my life as that. So I've never, ever made the choice to be a musician. Um, that related to that scene. Strangely enough, uh, my wife and I were dating and she was in New York and I was out there for a few weeks with my band. We were doing a residency and shows all over the place. And when we left to go for the rest of the tour, she made me two cassettes. And one was Awesome Mix Volume 1 and one was Awesome Mix Volume 2. And it looks exactly like those cassettes. And I'm going to find them. I'm going to find them because they're from a long time ago. But when I saw that, I was like, what? <laughs> so... Um, that was kind of a cool, relatable thing. But as far as characters, I mean, I really, I really love the Groot character uh, because, you know, we're feeling Groot, but, you know, we're obviously not led by clear dialogue. Obviously, if they need to clarify a beat of the story, then Rocket will interpret what he said for us. But um, I thought that it, it, that was an opportunity to really open up emotionally and write for that. And then, of course... Uh, the Black Tears theme is based on Peter Quill losing his mother. And so that, you know, that has always stayed with me. And then on the first movie, um, my eldest daughter played all the piano parts. She was 12 when she did that. So that was a big deal for, for me. Because it's not because she's my kid. It's because I've done a lot of movies where they're light, piano parts and they sound ham-fisted sometimes on the scores and I'm like huh but she plays with a beautiful you know sense of grace and emotion so she actually went out and played with the London Orchestra on this one at Abbey Road so I was pretty cool at 15 years old I hadn't done anything but shovel horse shit at that point so <laughs> I grew up on a ranch and that's a whole other story um, but you know, Was there a cue that was unused from yeah. the first one? Oh, they they definitely put some music of mine from other movies. They are very good about it. I just I just say I'm not going to listen to any anyone else's music. Um, it's it shuts me down. So some people don't react well to that but when they understand and I'm willing to create something right then and there then they are comfortable James knows me well enough so he is comfortable with it um, it's kind of interesting there was one cue like like I said the business has changed so when I did movies like uh, Dawn of the Dead even though that happened quickly there are no notes I did 69 minutes and 59 second score. There was not one note. It was just love notes. It was like, it's great. I went a decade with no notes. Um, now it's all notes. Uh, but in about 2010 or 11, things really started changing. So just because of the digital media, the, the tempo at which films can change and, and, and they can you know, uh, examine new ideas, um, it's not always is organic, and I, that's why I write music in advance, because as soon as you're in the post-production, everything's like a speeding train. What did I say to Victoria at Marvel? I said, you know what? Writing music for this movie is like painting a mural on the side of a speeding bullet train. And she's like, that is great. She says, you're so right. I'm like, yeah, because you know, it's changing every day. It's like by the time I show a piece of music, the picture's already changed, and you just can't chop, chop, chop all the time because the voice leading between chords. And here I'm getting very tangential. But um, I remember there was a cue or two that was temped from one of my other films. And, and I spent so much time, especially Watchmen. Like I was just in it for like a year, you know. Um, 
that I couldn't divorce myself from that piece of music. And so Tim, who is my orchestrator, who's an awesome composer in his own right, uh, you know, very close friend of mine, I said, Tim, can you rewrite my temp, the temp of my cue? Because I can't see it any differently. And uh, I said, you know, they want it imbued with that feeling, but I, I can't do it and do a better version of that. And so he did. And um, then from there, then we go back and forth. And, you know, a lot of the times there's, there's many phases of music development, but when we get into the orchestration part of it, Tim handled, he's the orchestration leader, and he has like eight orchestrators who work with him. That's how many notes there are in the score. Just for the choir, if you can fathom this, there are 7,200 pages of music just for the choir parts for this movie. So the, the orchestra itself is way more because there's it's really complex underneath the melodies, you know, so there's a lot of notes in there. But anyway, so in orchestration, I'll go to, to Tim's studio and we'll go through each cue and we'll discuss, okay, maybe we really want this to sing. Let's add a couple trumpets at the top of this French horn line. And then sometimes, you know, we'll get to a cue and I'll be like, hang on a second, he has two pianos in the studio, so I'll sit at a piano and... I'm a shitty piano player, but I get my ideas across. And I'll come up with, you know, counter melodies and different voicings for chords and stuff, and we make all the adjustments there. So the music is, is curated over time. It begins with my themes and my initial ideas, and then we all work away. But when I'm writing forward, and then there are 10 adjustments that need to be made in reels two and three, and, well, it's Friday afternoon, and we like them for the Monday night screening, so... You know, I have to have a team of, of people that I know and trust and who know me and understand my sensibilities. But uh, I'm fortunate enough to have people that I really admire who I think are great. And I think there's more of like the record producer's mind set of myself is looking at everyone's unique talents and voice and finding a way to, to enlist them to to be who they are in the context of what we're doing. Like, who I am is who I am, but in the context of Guardians of the Galaxy, it's James Gunn's score, you know? So I call that together, and we all are very enthused by music and still, you know, continue to enjoy finding new music and exploring different ideas. And so there's a lot of conversation, uh, and then I'm writing, and, you know, but it's fun, you know? And try and make it uh, create an environment where everyone feels really, really happy and and like they're very much part of something and not stuffed under the cupboard. Now, uh, in summation, uh, James has announced he's uh, back on board for Guardians uh, Volume Three. Uh, where where do you personally hope these films go? Uh, just as movies musically are themes for Adam Warlock bubbling around your head right now. It's interesting, yeah. He he did ask me to do the next one at the premiere. Um, I would like to just I'd like to be a little harder with it musically. I'd like to hit some drums and play more guitar in it, um, not diminish the emu the emotional impact, but um, I would like the score to take on a more dominant role. I mean, the songs are always going to be there. But there are moments sometimes where I just wish it was a score moment, you know. And maybe it's because I love the song. I don't know. Like The Chain, I love that song. It's my favorite Fleetwood Mac song. So I would love to have scored that because I probably am feeling the emotion of seeing the movie with that in it. I don't know. I just, I really don't pontificate as to what I hope the next one is. I know it's going to be great because I'm sure James is already looking at the choices he feels he could have made for this and the depth of character that he'd like to explore and express in another one. So I don't really have an opinion about it. I know he's going to come up with something that's great and I guarantee you if he's doing volume three, it will, it'll be, be it'll be the best of the three. I'm, well, sure, I'm sure of it. I'm sure it will be. Let's give it up for Tyler Bates.